Charles Metz. Welcome to my home here in Palm Springs, California. I'm delighted to present this video of four instruments that I have here in my home that I will be able to play each one and talk a little bit about them for you tonight. During the pandemic, our lives have changed drastically, but I hope that it's been able for you to do as much productive work as I have. I have worked very hard in practicing and I've found a new technique of audio recording and video recording. So you will see my handiwork, uh, which is following. Um, I am putting this all together on my own. It's no, not the most elaborate, but I think it, it works well. So the four instruments I'm going to play for you are a virginal, a Italian harpsichord, French harpsichord, and a Viennese forte piano. So let's start with the virginal. This instrument I have is quite unique. I literally found this instrument in an antique shop about 15 years ago, being sold as a piece of painted furniture. They had no idea what it was. I really wasn't certain what it was either when I first looked at it. But after doing some inspection of it and doing some work in terms of the um, measuring of the case and of the scroll work, a lot of detective work has gone in to be able to determine that this instrument was made by Francesco Poggi in approximately 1590 in Florence, Italy. It is one of believed to be 18 in the world of his instruments that are still extant, and this is one of three in private hands. It took three years for the restoration, but the soundboard is the original plank of wood, and it is made of cypress, and it is one plank from one tree. It's not pieces put together. So when we did the restoration, and it was Walter and Berta Burr who did the restoration, they were able to shim the cracks, and then the most amazing thing was that they were able to flatten the soundboard. The soundboard had caved down over the years of, of the pressure of the bridges, but with a careful technique of putting braces underneath the soundboard and then pushing up and at the same time wetting the top of the soundboard, very gradually over a three-year period of wetting and drying and wetting and drying, the soundboard went back to its original flat state. So that's one of the beauties of this particular instrument in its resonance, because it has been restored so magnificently. Another major thing that you'll notice in this instrument is the decoration. We were able to determine that the decoration was from the 19th century, because the elemental pigment was zinc white, and that was not available to artists until after 1830. So it's possible that the original instrument, built in circa 1590, was just a plain wooden box. Because we x-rayed the lid and there's no painting underneath that or any painting underneath the side cases. So it was done in a restoration um, that is labeled underneath the soundboard that was written and described that in 1891 it was restored. So the instrument probably was not played for many, many years. Uh, but now that it's been restored, I'm having great opportunities to do a lot of work with it. So I'm doing two Elizabethan pieces, pieces that would have been contemporary um, for this instrument. One actually was Thomas Tallis, which was actually a little bit pre-Elizabethan, um, 1570s. And then the second piece I'm going to do is the Frog, which is a setting of a galliard by John Dowland. What you want to notice in these two pieces is the color of the instrument changes drastically between the lower registers and the top registers which gives a wonderful delineation in the lines. You'll also notice that the keyboard is quite small and the key heads are quite short. So I use what is called historical fingering, where I do a lot of 2 one 2 one 3 4, three, four and don't use the modern approach of the thumb under. And this works very well on this small keyboard. So when I do close shots of the hand work, the finger work, you will notice that there are many times that I am sort of crawling over my fingers, which we believe is the appropriate fingering of the time. So the pandemic has made a lot of things different for us, but one of the things that's positive is that you're going to see this instrument and hear it at a very intimate level. So let us follow with that video.
The second instrument that I'm going to play for you is a copy of a 17th century Italian instrument. It was built by David Beyer in St. Louis in 1977. David was a very gifted builder and unfortunately only built about 10 instruments. Then he went on to build guitars quite successfully. But um, I'm very happy to have this instrument. It is a wonderful sound and works very well for this music. The Italian instrument was the, the instrument that was used by orchestras, chamber orchestras, uh, chamber groups. It was the go-to instrument for people to use with other instruments. Because of its sharp attack, the continual part of the harpsichord could keep the rhythm and could keep the ensemble together. Because there were no conductors back in the 17th and 18th century, no one standing up front beating a wand. It usually was the person sitting at the harpsichord who conducted maybe a little bit of hand gesture, but it was the instrument itself that kept the ensemble together. So when you listen to this, hear the quick and sh sharp attack of this instrument and understand how it was used. Another important thing to watch in this particular video or to listen to is that I have it tuned in a quarter comma mean tone tuning. You don't need to know what that is other than it was a historical temperament and basically it was a temperament that robbed Peter to pay Paul so that he didn't play in all keys. So we, we temper the um, individual notes so that certain keys were more pure and other keys were less pure. So composers do this very well and whenever they wrote a cadence and you went from one chord to another, many times they exploited the, the previous chord being somewhat um, dissonant um, and then resolving to a very consonant and pure sounding resolution. And you'll hear that many times in this piece. This is a Toccata by Michelangelo Rossi. Rossi in his day was actually a violinist. He is only known for this one volume of keyboard music. It was published in about 1656, the year before he died. We however believe that the music was written much earlier, maybe in the 1630s, and that he was somehow related or worked with Frescobaldi because the style of the music is very similar. But it's a very episodic piece, so it will start and stop and have different tempos within, which actually makes it quite exciting. And this was part of the 17th century style music, where it wasn't all perfectly regular and all in perfect harmony as we know the Baroque to be in the later music of Handel and Bach. So please enjoy Michelangelo Rossi's Toccata Prima.
The third instrument I'm going to play for you is a copy of an 18th century French harpsichord. It was built by Walter and Bertha Burr in 1982 and modeled after the Benoit Stelen instrument that sits at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. This is the culmination of the harpsichord in the 300 years of its building traditions. It has two manuals and lots of color and a five octave range, much bigger than the two previous instruments that you've seen. I'm going to play a piece by Jean-Philippe Rameau, who's more famous for his operas. But he wrote a number of keyboard works which are also quite well known and quite delightful. This piece is called Le Tourbillon, which is translated loosely as the whirlwind. And so I will use the instrument in the rondo form, which is what this piece is, which has an A, which returns, goes to a B part, a C part, with A in between. So you'll notice that I go back to the upper manual each time we go back to the main theme, the rondo. So no fancy fingering here other than it's uh, much more virtuosic. And in the third um, part of the, uh, of the rondo is um, some quite unique scalar work which is to imitate the whirlwinds. So again, Jean-Philippe Rameau and the Turbillon.
which was the typical style of furniture in this time, which would have been about 1805. Napoleon had invaded Egypt, and the furniture reflected that. So you'll notice that the heads of the legs have Egyptian women's heads on it, which would have reflected exactly as they would have done at that time. This mahogany is actually from Nigeria. The original mahogany would have been from Cuba, but of course we cannot harvest any mahogany from Cuba no, any longer, it's forbidden. The Viennese forte piano is a world different than the harpsichord. It is a world different because of its action. It's not that different in terms of the layout of the strings or the soundboard or even the weight of the strings. They were relatively similar. But it was a transition of taking the plucking mechanism out and being able to put in a mechanism um, that would throw a hammer against the string. And that's the key with the piano is that you can't have a hammer go up and strike the string and stay on the string because it would stop the sound of the string. It has to have an action that throws the hammer against it and then falls away. And Anton Walter was given the credit to be able to develop this prel mechanic, which is the ability of this particular hammer to be able to hit the string and fall away. And this is also what we call the Viennese action. It eventually died out because it is lighter in its sound and not as forceful. It didn't work with the 19th century pianos and wanting more volume in concert halls. But it is perfectly suited to Mozart, which is the smaller drawing rooms and the intimate sound. The sonata I'm going to play for you, just the first movement, is well known. Actually, it was written late in his life. And it has been labeled facisole, which is actually an Italian term for easy. And it's not that it's the most difficult sonata, but it's not exactly easy. But Mozart did not name it that. That was probably named by a publisher later on. But I think the beauty of the work is in its clarity and its simplicity. You also notice on this instrument that it has no pedals on the floor. It actually has knee levers. So I am not using the damper pedal at all in this piece, but I am using what's called the moderator. And the moderator is a stop that allows felt to come between the hammer and the strings. And it gives a more muted and quieter sound. So in a few sections, when the quality of the sound of the instrument changes, I'm using the moderator. So listen for that quite carefully. But also listen to the clarity that this instrument can give in this kind of passage work, which is difficult to get from a modern piano because of its louder sound, its bigger sound, and its more sustained, which is wonderful in its own right, but it doesn't work as well as this instrument does for this music. This instrument also, because of its wooden nature and no metal harp, it allows different colors within the registers. So when Mozart changes a pattern or a you know, theme from one octave to another, it suddenly has a different character. And he knew that, he wrote for that, and he understood that. So please enjoy a piece you know very well on a Viennese forte piano as Mozart would have heard. Thank you. Thank you. 